Stephanie, I appreciate the prayer about us having the mind of Christ and the peace and joy because that's exactly what we've been talking about the past couple of weeks and what we're going to continue talking about for the rest of the quarter. Um, the, right, right now, the roll is going to be going around, and so just check off your name. If your name is not on the roll, add it to the back and put your email address on there, and we'll add you to our newsletter. And um, with the roll, too, put your prayer request. If you'd like to have those included in the newsletter, just write them out there on the right column. And then a little take-home for you tonight. There's an envelope going around with the roll, and there are bookmarks with um, scriptures on them. And I thought that might be nice for everybody to just take one. And you may want to flip through and pick one out that kind of speaks to you tonight. And then just put it in your Bible or stick it on your mirror in your bathroom and, and read it throughout the week. And I think the front is like a short scripture and the back has the full scripture on it. So I just thought that'd be nice for y'all to have a little take home to meditate on a scripture. So any other announcements? The newsletter, has everybody been getting it that has given me their email? Okay, because the Key might be that if you're not, it may be in your junk folder. So look in there, and then once I think once you mark it once or twice that it's not junk, then it'll start coming into your normal email. So, okay, well, we'll get started now. Um, the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about minding your minds. That's kind of the, the theme of this whole class, the whole quarter, is how to take control of our minds. And the study is coming out of the book of Philippians. And where we just see Paul gives us such great information in, in ways to handle minding our minds. And in the newsletter each week, I've been putting the goals of the class. And to just remind everybody, the goals of studying this um, is to learn about Paul's um, example of intentional thinking. And how he's showing us how really what you think is what you are. And you've got to think about what you're going to be thinking about. So it, practicing intentional thinking is one of the goals of the class. Another one is to realize that we have a choice. And I think that one is huge. We have a choice of what we think about. We have a choice of what we do. We have a choice of how we handle different situations. And we're really going to get into that tonight when we're talking about the weapons that we use to mind our minds. And then the third goal of this class is by the time we get done with this is to have transformed our way of thinking, to have a mind of, of like Christ and to be focused on him. So how are we going to be doing this? Well, tonight we're going to be talking about some weapons we use to mind our minds. But before we get into that, if you were here last week, you might have seen this picture that Kathy put up. And to me, I mean, that just really was disturbing to me. And I, and I was... You know, when you think of Satan, you, you just picture him in all different ways. But one thing I was thinking is Satan, he doesn't necessarily just come at us in one big fell swoop, one big thing. He can come at us just little by little by little, like a dripping faucet. It can just wear on you. And one of the ways he really gets to us is by minding our minds. That's one thing he's trying to do is get into our heads and to control what we think. And I just, when she showed this picture last week, it just, I started thinking about that, is how he really can get into your minds. And so that's why we've got to be ready to fight this. We've got to take battle against him trying to take control of our minds. So um, we're going to get into that tonight um, in just a minute. Let me see something, put my glasses on here. Um, uh, we had a homework assignment, so if you saw the um, if you saw the email, you would have seen our homework assignment. And so, just to kind of recap this, we've I've handed out Philippians two, and that's just the printout um, that everybody got. And so, if we're just going to take just a, maybe two minutes, and we're going to just go through that on your own, read the first couple of verses, and if you have a pen, underline what what made Paul's joy complete. And if you don't, just read, read through that. And then go ahead and look at the second question of what are results of worshiping and living like Jesus? And then last, how are we unlike the world? And so just kind of go through that for a minute or two, and then we'll talk about it.
Okay. And this is class participation now. What made Paul's joy complete? Being of the same mind. Yes. Ha having the same love and being in full accord and of one mind. Exactly. Being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, esteeming others better than self, looking out for others. So definitely putting others before himself. Okay, the second question, I don't know why these all say number one on them, but in my notes they say number two and three. Um, what are results of worshiping and living like Jesus? And this was in verses 12 through 17. Yes, being blameless and harmless children of God and shining as lights in the world where we can rejoice. Okay, the last question, how are we unlike the world? Has anybody kind of thought about that, how, how we should be unlike the world? We should be focusing on others and focusing on Christ. And we should do this without rumbling and complaining is what it says too in there in verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. So really what we see here is Paul is giving us some weapons on how we can mind our minds. Um, we may not necessarily think of these as really powerful weapons or aggressive, but, but they are ways we can do this. And this is through humility. We've got to train our minds to stop the spirals that we've been talking about, about when you just start, your mind just starts going all different directions. You've got to focus, and you've got to figure out what are you going to focus on. And this is something that you have to practice, and you have to train to do this. So um, this is a verse that's in Romans 12, too, which is also Paul speaking. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And Paul is telling us here that the world can't satisfy us. We must focus on God. And minding our minds is really the key to this transformation. And he's giving us the weapons and the tools to do this when he's talking in Philippians 2. So we kind of touched on all these just very briefly last week in Kathy's weapon, but tonight we're going to go more in depth on the first three. We're going to be talking about humility, which we just talked about in Philippians 2, humility versus self-importance. We're going to be talking about silence versus noise, and we're going to talk about delight versus cynicism. And you think about weapons. I like the terminology that's used here um, about using to fight. With a weapon, would you just pick it up and start using it? You would probably train on how to use it. I think of people that have gun permits. Hopefully you've taken a class or you've done some type of training before you're able to just take that and go off and do something with it. And you think about like in the military, they train extensively on how to use weapons. They don't just pull them out and use them willy-nilly. They, they know what they're doing with them. And that's something here that for us to be able to mind our minds, we've got to train ourselves. And we've got to train ourselves on how to use these weapons. And so tonight, as we go through the first three, we'll talk about kind of what they are, but then ways you can practice this in your life. So then when you do start these spiraling thoughts in your mind of self-importance, of noise, of cynicism, you'll have a way to deal with it. So, and then next week we're going to be talking about the next four uh, of these weapons. Okay, self-importance versus humility. A lie that's out there is the more self-esteem I have, the better life will go for me. A lot of people think that um, I've got to be great, I've got to succeed, I've got to be the best that I can, and I've just got to have enough. And another big push right now, like you see in the media and in, uh, just out there in the world, is that you're enough. 
you're you're great. You're you're everything. You're you you are enough. And we're trying to tell each other that. Well, you know what? We can never be enough. We we can't. God is what is enough for us. The more I choose God and others over myself, the more joyful I will be. Um, you you hear a lot of times in the news a lot of CEOs or politicians or people that are in like high-powered positions, a lot of times those people struggle. They have trouble with drinking, with drugs, with affairs, a low self-esteem, and you think, well, how could that be when they're in these big top positions and have all this power? And a lot of times it's because they're just seeking more and more and more worldly things. And they're never gonna have enough because the only thing that could ever be enough would be God. And, and a lot of times they'll turn to other devices with things like that. Um, so think about this. Do you spend time looking on the internet like Facebook or Instagram so you can rejoice with your sisters and, and your friends and be like, yay, I'm so happy for them? Are you really out there comparing yourself to them, worried about what people are thinking about you and about how many likes you're getting and how many people are, are seeing your stuff, or are you really out there trying to think about others and rejoice with them? When you look at the first half of Philippians 2 on your page that we just went through, that is absolutely a true picture of humility. And Paul talking about, about this, saying, do nothing for selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourself, which is, is yours in Christ Jesus. He goes on to say in um, verses 5 through 8, which you can read along with me on your page. I don't have it up here on the screen. But he goes on to say, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even on death on a cross. That's what made his joy complete, is, is knowing that Christ Jesus died for him. That's what Paul's saying there, and that he, he did not consider himself great by taking on the form of a human. He humbled himself to man and became obedient to death. And then Paul goes on to tell us in Philippians 3 later on, and we'll be getting into this in the next couple of weeks, but he talked about whatever gain he had, he counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And basically, Paul is saying everything about the world and everything about things, he counted it as rubbish, comparing that to what the difference in what you would have if you have the life of Christ. Paul disregarded what the world esteems. And you think about today, a lot of times we're comparing and contrasting, justifying and judging and spending tons of time contemplating, contemplating our identity and place in the world. And Paul cautions us against this back to the Philippians. It's the same thing that happens today that was happening back then and him telling people back then, humble yourselves. Um, practice humility, put others before yourselves. And that message still rings true today. That's what we need to be doing. And we don't need to be worrying about what other people think, but we need to be thinking about Christ. The definition of humility is a condition of lowliness or affliction in which one experiences a loss of power or prestige. Does that sound glamorous? Lowliness, affliction, loss of power and prestige. You know, outside of the biblical faith, the world would just consider this crazy. It wouldn't be considered a virtue. But when you think about it in a Christian context, humility is considered the proper attitude of us towards our creator. It is a grateful and spontaneous awareness that life is a gift. It's absolute dependence on God. 
So you think about this quote here from C.S. Lewis, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking of yourself less. And Paul tells us, like, humility, the theme of that is throughout all of the New Testament. And we have other verses where we read where Paul's talking about humility. Romans 12, 10, he says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. And in Ephesians, he says, With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. And a lot of times you'll see him talking about humility and love together. So I think those go hand in hand. I like this graphic about God should be the center of your life. And then you think about all these different categories that are out here. You've got family, health, politics, finances, church, everything else, work, recreation. God should be the center. And we weren't built to be the center of our world. And if we were the center, we'd probably be spinning all around. But you think about God, that gives us a safe landing spot for every one of these different things. When something's going wrong with health, go back to God. When something's going wrong with your finances, go back to God. Stay with him throughout all of it, with your family. Be grounded in that. Now, so I really liked this to just picture God is the center of your life and that everything else should be going off around that. And you think when thoughts are consumed with ourselves, we forget how much we need God. And um, we think we can do everything ourselves a lot of times, but we really need God to be that foundation and that support for us to, to be the hub of our, our lives. And back Philippians 2, 5 on your sheet, when you look in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. That's what Paul's telling us. Okay. I want to make sure I get my time in here. I think we're doing good. Um, upsides of humility. One thing, humility helps us let go of being awesome. <laughs> hey, I don't have to be awesome because God is. And it's really hard to live life on a pedestal. For one thing, the only way, place you can go is down when you're up on that high pedestal. And um, it makes a miserable home for you. And there's such freedom when thinking about this. Like, there's just freedom in thinking, I don't have to be awesome. If you don't have to worry about others are thinking of you, that your enoughness is only in Christ, and because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we get his awesomeness, his righteousness, and his forgiveness. We get rest, peace, and grace. And one of the things I used to always tell my girls, especially, not my son as much, but is... Nobody cares about you because they all care about themselves. I mean, so why, don't worry about what you look like because they're all worried about themselves. But once you can kind of get that in your head about, I don't really care what everybody else thinks because I care what God thinks. And if I know I've got my life grounded in God, everything's going to be okay. So humility helps you let go of that. Another thing, humility helps us see people as God sees them. And we read in Matthew 6, verse 33, promises as it, that verse promises as we cast away our own worries, God promises to care for us. And when we cast away ourselves, then we can have space for other people. If we're so consumed with ourselves, we can't think of others because we're just so bogged down with ourselves. And so then we can notice other people around us and we can think of ways that we can help them. And then a third way is it helps us treat people as Jesus would treat them. It's not all about me. And it allows you to see other people in their need. And so when you think about a spiral, you know, starting at the top and going down, um, I think in one of our emails we did a graphic of the, the thought spiral. But you can think about, like, if you're just mad at somebody, you could just, your, your spiral to, can just start going downward. You can be like... I'm better than other people and then you get selfish and then you just get drained in your mind and then at the end the consequence at the end is that you're just going to feel unloved and empty or you could flip that spiral around and you could think I just I'm, I'm mad but I'm going to choose God and others I'm going to be generous and joyful and I'm going to be fulfilled because I'm serving and thinking about others so you can just flip that spiral around Easier said than done, and that's why we have to have weapons to think about this. And that's why 
practicing humility can really be a great weapon to help you with those downward spirals and put you in an upward spiral to start thinking about other people and thinking about God. Okay, so that was tool number one about how to fight self-importance. Moving on into tool number two, silence. I love this verse, and that was actually one of the ones in the envelope. I think there were two of those in there, so I don't know who got those, but I wish I I'd kind of thought about getting them all to say the same thing, but um, thought people might like some other verses. But okay, with silence, you have to have something planned to fill your silence. And Kathy talked a little bit about this last week. She gave us some tools on ways to kind of feel silence. But really, silence with God is the ultimate form of humility. When we lay down everything and just stop and think about God, that's humbling ourselves to Him. And in the stillness and quiet, not only do we connect with God, but we can clearly identify what is wrong and we can recognize our spirals and naming spirals is one of the first steps in interrupting them. So think about this. Are you comfortable? That's uh, Psalms 46.10. Um, are you comfortable being alone with God? Does that make you nervous to think about that? Think about people that you're comfortable in silence with, that you're fine just sitting with. It's usually somebody that you know really well somebody that you're, 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 you're comfortable with. So are you afraid to be alone with God? Could you have the fear that if you're alone with him that you're going to figure out that you might need to be put to work? You might have the fear that you're going to be asked to change some of your ways and do something different and be called upon maybe get rid of some bad habits or get rid of some bad relationships. Um, being the fear of being put to work, maybe you're thinking like, I really need to forgive somebody or I need to reach out to somebody. Um, are you fear, or do you have a fear that you're going to be alone, that God's not going to be there when you try to, try to sit in silence with him? Are you worried that you can't face God as you are? And we read in Psalms 139.2 that God, he even knows every thought before we think it. So... He already knows if you're coming to him with different things. So um, with silence, the lie that we tell ourselves sometimes is, I'll feel better if I stay distracted. We think, like, I'll just keep busy. That will help keep my mind off things. I'll just keep myself moving and, and, and really just staying, staying active. The truth is, only being God, with God will satisfy me. A real, connected, intimate time with Jesus is the very thing that grows our faith and shifts our minds and helps stop the spirals. And we read in Psalm 84:10, "Better it was one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere." You can choose to be still with God. There's that word again: choice. Choose. We have a choice. When we draw near to God, he draws near to us. And that comes out of James 4, verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Paul, formerly known as Saul, and just happened to have a picture of him, just like last week we had a picture of him. But um, he went through a massive change in his life. He was a great persecutor of Christians, and really... When he was on the road to Damascus and had the encounter with Jesus, that's really probably the first time he could see clearly, and that's also when he lost his eyesight. And you think about um, when we turn our problems to the one who holds the solution, we gain wisdom and insight, and we find one who is willing to help us. And Paul, Saul, also known as Paul, it's when all his distractions were removed is when he could see God clearly for the first time. And that's what we need to focus and turn our thoughts on God to help us see clearly. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, we read, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That's so comforting. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's that's a promise of peace and comfort when we turn ourselves to, to God. So when we can see clearly. Practice time alone with God. 
connection with him is the foundation for every other God-given tool or weapon we have to fight with. And some of the ideas that were given out last week was reading, meditating, journaling, um, serving others, don't dwell, don't dwell on what ifs, um, friends. Um, you know, you have this picture that in your head you're just going to get up every morning at 5.30 a.m. and have that cup of coffee and open your Bible and devotional book and have that quiet, steady, silence time with God. That's great and wonderful if you're doing that, and, and I, I commend you, and I, that would be great if I could do that all the time. But a lot of times your silent time might catch you at when you least expect it. Or it may be when you lay down for sleep at night, and that's when everything's running through your head, and you just, you, it's so noisy. But then that's when you need to think, I can have silent alone time with God now, and I can focus on some, some things, and you intentionally choose to focus on God at those times. You think about those spirals. You can have a discontent, you can have discontent, which would leave you frazzled, and then you would get distracted, and then it leaves you needy and frantic, and it ends up being insecure. That's a downward spiral. If you take that upward spiral, where you're discontent and frazzled, you have practiced stillness, you practice prayer and meditation and thought with God, leads to calmness and leads to security. So that's, the, that's your opposite there. So practicing silence can really help through that. Um, one of the things that in the book that we're using, it, it talked about how stillness and solitude with God can interrupt and rewrite your thought patterns. And so I thought this was really interesting. And basically you take your negative, to negative emotion because and reason, so I just stuck one in there, say I'm stressed because I'm sick. Maybe you're going through a lot with your health and you're really stressed with it. Well, you could rewrite this pattern with the weapon of silence. How to do that? You take your negative emotion, so you would have the I'm stressed and I'm sick, so I will choose to remember God is with me and will help me through this. By practicing the stillness and quietness and silence with God, you can rewrite your choice of how you're going to react in a different situation. Another one I, you know, that you might think about is, I'm upset because I'm working and I don't know how I'm going to make, make ends meet. Well, you could think, well, I'm working I can't make ends meet, but I'll choose to pray to God for help and ask him to be with me to help me make right decisions. So by choosing how you're going to react in the situation and practicing silence can be a great weapon to help the spiraling of your mind. Okay, the last tool I'm going to talk about tonight is delight. And I just want you to know, today was the most delightful day. The weather was incredible. I was inside most of the day, and I, I went outside at 3 o'clock, and the wind was blowing. The sky was just beautiful. And driving to church tonight, oh, the sky, the colors were just incredible. So, I mean, delight in God's handiwork. Um, but uh, we're going to be talking delight versus cynicism. And we talked a little bit about cynicism last week and about just the negative thinking. Okay. <laughs> Are you going to be choose, this is the word again, choose to be a bitter, old, cranky person as you grow older? Are you going to choose to be pleasant and joyful? Are you going to choose to just go through life with your arms crossed, looking at everybody, just thinking everything's bad, everything's awful? Is that who you're going to choose to be? Um, or are you going to choose to go through with a more pleasant and joyful attitude in life, looking at the positives as you age? Um, are we going to stand by and watch life with arms crossed and think, life's not fair to me, um, me, 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 so which, how are we going to act? Um, you know, we may not choose the situations that we get put in. We may not choose the people that are around us, but we can choose how we react in those situations. And that's one of the things about minding our mind on choosing this. Rather than seeing the best and celebrate the good, a lot of times we look and only look for the struggles and complaints in life. 
Okay, think about if you go to a party and you sit at a table and everybody at your table is like, oh, the food is awful. Oh, it's so crowded in here. It's hot. Oh, I can't believe the, that they've done it this way. You could have that. What if you chose to sit at this other table and they're like, oh, the food is wonderful. Oh, it's so pretty in here. It's so nice that she invited us. How are you going to feel when you leave the party if you were at table number one? And how are you going to feel when you leave the party at table number two? Well, what if you took that and said, instead of a party, it's your life? Okay? That you're talking about. Are you looking and celebrating the good? Or are you being cynical about everything? It's your perspective. It's your outlook. It's your choice. Um, are you going to be known to your friends and family as somebody that's always pointing out the negative? Or are you going to be known as somebody that's positive and joyful in situations? Um, one thing about cynicism, uh, just to kind of define that term a little more, some of the things a study was done, and this was just out of our book, but it, cynicism is always driven by fear of the future or anger of the past. It can be from hurt that you've experienced. It can make you cynical about things. It destroys our ability to delight in the world around us and fully engage with others. It can make you put up walls with other people when you're being cynical about things. It puts our mind on earthly things and we lose hope because things of, these earth, things of the earth aren't permanent. It usually grows because we think we deserve better than we're getting or because we're jealous of what somebody else is getting. Cynicism blocks out our potential for joy. And we read that, we'll be reading that later on in Philippians 4 where it says rejoice in the Lord always. Okay, consider Paul's description of what happens when we, like the Israelites, turn our gaze away from the worldly things and towards God and delight in his glory. And this is from 2 Corinthians 3.18, but I'm actually going to read 16 through 18, just so it'll kind of give you a little more of this. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to the other. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. I love that word freedom in there. I wish I had put that verse up there, but when I started looking at it more, I was like, oh, i got to add that the verse about freedom. God is a living, personal presence, and our faces shine in the brightness of his face. As we become like him, he makes our lives brighter and more beautiful. And in Philippians 2, earlier in our on our, our sheet, we see where... We can shine as a light in the world. And that's out of verse, let's see. Oh, I didn't write down what verse it is, but it's talking about us being a light in the world. Which, 15, yes, in verse 15. So you may want to underline that. Okay, cynicism versus delight. You've always heard the term, are you like, is a glass half full or glass half empty? What kind of person are you? With cynicism, a lie is that people are not trustworthy and life will not work out. The truth is, God is trustworthy and will, in the end, work all things together for good. And we read in Romans 8:28, and this is Paul writing this, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Beauty and delight is evidence of something beyond ourselves. Beauty is evidence of a world yet to come, of a creator who is loving and profoundly delightful. Beauty floods in and interrupts when, instead of cynicism, we choose trust. I love this verse. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. We have the hope of heaven. We live our lives like that. We can delight in this. We can, we can use the weapon of delight because we have the hope of heaven. 
You think about somebody with inner beauty. Have you ever known somebody that just, they just shine from the inside? I want to be that person. Um, and, and why can they do that? It's because they hold God in their heart and they, they've got that hope of heaven. It's like a secret that they're carrying around. You know, that song about I've got something in my pocket, it belongs across my face. Yeah, that's what I like to think about about that is that you're just glowing from within. And no matter what's going on around you, that you can delight in that. Um, we're almost done. Is that just the first? Does that mean I have like one more minute? or? Okay, well, uh, two more minutes. Okay. All right. Can y'all tell what that is? It's a peacock. Okay. I truly believe goodness and beauty of the world was meant to point us towards God. In Psalms 19.1, we read, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. God has gone to great lengths to craft us. We weren't accidents. Whatever is weighing us down, God can take care of it. And you think of a peacock. It's so delightful. It's colors. It's detail. I saw one in person. I guess it was at Davis and Ashley's wedding. It was just amazing, uh, that, that bird that God created. It was just beautiful. And um, what kind of God does that and makes something like that? A delightful God. Um, goodness is meant not to merely make us feel good, but it's made to point us to God. It's all around us. Talking about our spirals, your downward spiral, you could have hurt. You could be critical, sarcastic, and it leaves you cold and cynical. Or you can have an upward spiral where you're delighting, where you might have hurt, but you know that God is trustworthy. He, if you believe the best in others, you'll be engaged and curious, and you'll be trusting in God. In conclusion tonight, with minding our minds, you've got to have something to focus on. And being single-minded and minding our minds is impossible unless we do have something to focus on, something that's worthy of consuming our every thought, hope, and dream. Only one thing in our life can fulfill this the one who created and died for us. You can't realistically think we're going to be able to think about God all the time, not even half the time. And you think about, if, if anybody knew what I was thinking about, I would have no friends. I would, nobody would like me or love me. But you know what? God, who know you know my foolishness and my sins are not hidden from you. God, like I said earlier, knows everything about you, and he still loves you. And this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It's a song that we sing sometimes, that, which helps you remember it. But the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. His mercies are new every morning. And we get a fresh start again, again, again. And that's because of the blood of Jesus. So wrapping up, we talked about three weapons we can use, humility, silence, and delight. And let's see if we can think about those this week and put them into practice. And when you start those spiralings of different things, think about being humble. Think about silence with God and think about delighting in things in the world. And on the back of your handout, just if you've got time this week, do that little survey. And one being good, I, I, think, I don't know if one was good or bad, let me see. One is I don't do this well, and ten is I do this great. And if you just kind of go down and shade in where you fit in and look to see are you closer to ones, fives, or tens, see if you think you're practicing humility versus self-serving or delight versus cynicism, and that might give you an idea of what areas you might really need to work on throughout, um, throughout your life. So, Well, that is everything, and I'm going to end this in just a really quick prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for all the ladies that have been here tonight, and thank you that we get to study the Bible freely with you and, and can share that with, with other people in this country. Please help us to practice these weapons, to mind our mind, to be able to focus and to mind our minds as we go throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you all for being here. Did everybody get a bookmark? Okay. Okay, we'll make sure. I'll find the envelope.